So how many of guys here have MetaMask? All right, almost everyone. With the ones who don't have MetaMask, please install that. That'll be very helpful. Um, the second thing is, um, how many of you guys are backend developers here? So it looks like almost everyone knows backend. Uh, or about front-end coding? OK, 30 40%. And what about uh, Solidity developers? OK, so that's about 25%, I guess, right? And that's, that's, that's not a bad number, actually, because I think all, all of us over here are basically here to learn new things. But then, you know, I think this uh, conversation over here will be much more relevant to the ones who are front-end and back-end developers. And uh, for smart contracts, you need to use other layer ones like, you know, um, Polygon or, or Ethereum, right? Now, <coughs> quick, demo, quick, quick thing about, you know, us. Uh, Stack is a decentralized cloud. It is the world's largest decentralized cloud. And, you know, I'll go through the numbers uh, soon. Um, Talking about the vision first, right? So first of all, the way we look at this thing is we kind of challenge the status quo by empowering humans, machines, DAOs to govern their application infrastructure that is decentralized, unstoppable, and extremely easy to use, right? And by this, basically, we stand for uh, ensuring we provide a freedom of speech and expression, right? So that's, in a sense, what you do. Because right now, if you want to run applications, the front end and the back end, all you have to do is rely on these settled cloud providers like Amazon Web3, you know, Web um, you know, Amazon AWS, and uh, S3 and, and for storage. And then also comes along with you know, uh, GCP, Azure, you name them, right? So that's where StackOS comes in. As a fundamental mission is that you know, we are a cross-chain infrastructure protocol. Uh, that is basically the bedrock for all the future generations of applications to come. That means not just your smart contract layer, but also your front-end and the back-end applications can be run on the decentralized web. A uh, quick thing about myself is you know, I am a finance and international business major from Harvard University. You know, I came from US last year, uh, moved here permanently, hopefully, for some time at least. Uh, mechanical engineer by background. But you know, I worked in the cloud space uh, since almost over 12 years, 10 years, and uh, you know, I've got patent in cryogenic engines, and you know, when basically it helped uh, build AWS uh, when during the early days you know, of, of the start. That's 2011-ish. Uh, so. The, what is the current landscape, right? So the first thing is that we talk about Uniswap, and uh, Uniswap is something which everyone knows. I, how many of you guys know Uniswap? Okay, that's a good number. So, you know, but we all know this thing that they kind of delisted all the security tokens from their website, and that is kind of very ironical for you know, someone saying there's a Web3 project, but in a sense they are, can be forced uh, by the governments and the SECs to kind of you know, self-regulate or have them remove the security tokens because it comes under the purview of the SEC. When you talk about um, a, a parallel equal of Parla, so how many of you guys uh, know Parla? Oh, very few, I guess, a few hands, that's it. So um, how many of you guys know Donald Trump? <laughs> Everybody, right? Cool. So, um, so you probably also knew before Elon Musk came in, he was banned from Twitter, right? And that was because uh, of whatever ideologies they had. But, but in a sense, if you think of it this way, not really talking about what ideology be you believe in, but thinking of this as you know a, a bar on people didn't like what he said, so they kind of banned him from there, right? So, um, so Twitter kind of you know removed uh, uh, Donald Trump. They ended up using, they, uh, I mean, Donald Trump and its community started to use an application called Parla. And guess what happened, right? They used Parla and the AWS completely shut down uh, Parla application from the servers, right? Not just that, App, uh, Apple App Store also removed it from their App Store. So that's kind of, you know, you see this is coming more and more uh, in, in this world where when we want to start expressing ourselves, there's going to be a complete industry trying to, you know, protect itself. And uh, that, that's kind of what we kind of fight for. Other thing is that why do you think like Web2 has been so successful, right? But what are the problems right now also, I think, which comes along? So the first thing, a drawback of Web2 is that the incentive mechanisms are not aligned. And when I say that, it's basically you know, the shareholders of the company are the ones who benefit from the protocol or, or their services, but not the people who are using it. So that's kind of the dramatic changes in this outlook. Um, you know, it is pretty expensive to operate for the ones. How many of you guys have uh, built on AWS or created servers and launched there? Okay, so that's about 20%, right? And uh, you are probably also familiar with DevOps and you know one of the most expensive engineering domains. And it takes a lot of things uh, to, to fall in place to make it work properly. So for instance, um, 
if you were to get a production environment up, it takes about six to seven weeks to get a stable production environment ready, right? Just to make sure everything works fine and not. Uh, nothing really falls and drops apart. So, but that being said, what really changes things is that, uh, is that something which we should be worrying about, right? Because first of all, it may take you that long, but yet we have seen time and time, or time and over again, that um, these services do not really, even though they're production, all the secrets are lost. You know, people get hacked and whatnot. Uh, last pass, you know, they got hacked yesterday. Um, so that's kind of concerning when you talk about you know, someone who's a security company also can't protect their environment. So that's something which is kind of concerning there. So and again, no anonymity, right? That means if you're deploying, let's say on AWS, uh, you need to first you know, give your grandfather's details to Amazon, right? And, uh, and that's kind of, uh, Ironical, right? How, how do you really work with this at scale? Um, something like a DAO can never ever kind of own it because, again, you know, DAO doesn't have a grandfather, unfortunately, right? But for people to really run this, a community to govern this, the only way which we are aware of right now is a DAO. And that's kind of an issue which, which comes to Web2 and why it can't really, uh, really be used in, in a Web3 world. Now, that's, that bars the question, like, what we have so far, it, uh, yes, the Web2 provides us extreme you know, uh, easiness of use. It does provide us a lot of these uh, benefits of, uh, you know, uh, the great, great user experience. It has ways of, you know, ensuring people can access the software faster. But is it really decentralized if you're using AWS, even though the front-end layer? Because all, all that so far we've heard, like, in the last few years is we have smart contracts. They call it decentralized, but obviously they're using all these central services. So as an example of, you know, of a Facebook, and how do you decentralize something like that? So first thing is, just as an example, I've just given like one, two, three, four, five, five pillars. And, uh, you know, and again, there are many more, but just for simplicity and trying to fit something on the screen. Um, what's the presentation layer? That is the UI interface, right? Then you have the data storage layer, which has something like S3 or you know, uh, databases and whatnot. Then you have the AI analytics, um, you know, uh, machine learning, um, Again, for integrations also, like for communication, you require services which can kind of message and you, know, you can receive messages, be notified when something, an event happens. And then of course the data sources, right? That means that you need people to add data to Facebook so that you can actually use it uh, and, as a social network. So if today, if we have to build something like, uh, like, like Facebook on the decentralized web, the two things which we have right now, so one is the, the, the data layer, the, that is the storage. Uh, that means S3, uh, you know, you have IPFS for data, then you have, uh, you know, blockchains like Ethereum and Polygon to, you know, uh, as services. And then you have Chainlink, right, for, I mean, there are others, of course, but Chainlink is one of the prominent ones which kind of uh, get off-chain data on-chain, right? So that is kind of something which we have so far. But everything else currently runs on AWS. And, and again, I'm not naming AWS alone, but I think it's a generational problem, right? And, uh, and how do we solve something like this uh, in, in this new Web3 era we're trying to talk about? So, <clears throat> so that's where StackOS comes in. StackOS is a replacement for all of your presentation layers, your AI analytics layer, your integration layer, and again, there are several of those, right? And you can, I'm sure you guys can tell uh, what are the different services, you, you know, which, which kind of rely, we rely on AWS, even though we are kind of uh, supposed to be decentralized, right? So here are the, the, the real things which StackOS really solves for you. First of all, uh, the high DevOps cost is eliminated. That means you don't require to run infrastructure, you don't need to know AWS. You just need to know, uh, like you know, any of your normal regular applications and Docker. So, how many of you guys know Docker here? Oh, that's the, the most number of hands I've ever seen in the conference. So that's amazing, right? So all you need to do is Dockerize your application, and and you're ready to go, right? And, and I'll come to the details of how it works, really. Um, second one is environment preparation. Uh, you know, again, it, it cuts down from you know seven weeks to thirty seconds, so you can get your application live in less than thirty seconds on on Stack OS. That's kind of the power it kind of brings to you. Um, again, when you're trying to build something crypto native, how do you make sure that you know your you can pay without your credit card? Because again, you know you don't want to share your grandfather's details to to get access to uh, a bank account and do whatnot, right? In a decentralized web, at least. Third thing, uh, the fourth thing is the governance, right? That is again, as a DAO, as I said earlier, that this is kind of what it, it's kind of solves for. That how do you ensure that if the community wants a feature to upgrade, they can vote for it and agree that the next version should come out, right? So that's kind of how uh, this thing works. Now, this is a little older slide. The new version which we have is probably makes this thing into two steps, right? But uh, first thing is that to deploy anything on Stack OS, you need to do Docker. So Dockerize your application, right? Once you do that, 
you just go reserve compute on uh, on Stack OS. It's just say that you want to purchase uh, 500 uh, megabytes of compute uh, for for uh, for RAM and let's say you know uh, 200 millicores of compute, and it can be very granular, as granular as you want. And after that, you can just go to the UI, you know, and you just click a button, and it just deploys those things, you know, on Stack OS. So that's kind of how easy it is. And I'll go through a demo of just of that. So as I said earlier, so we are the category leaders in, in, in the decentralized cloud. And uh, the numbers talk for itself, right? But it is the world's most utilized and the fastest growing decentralized cloud. Right? So we have total about, this is 73, it's an older version. Uh, I think uh, we have about the morning or yesterday, so about, we were hitting at uh, 81 million requests of uh, website served to the network. Um, we have about 3,500 plus applications deployed. And we have about almost 1,600 uh, applications running on Stack OS, right? And that's kind of the power of what, what we have. In fact, we main, went mainnet. Uh, we've been working for, for over six years, by the way, guys. It's not a new project. We just came out from nowhere. But our mainnet was last year, month of August. Uh, you know, interestingly, after August, so in the next five months, in January of uh, this year, we overtook the largest competitor. And now we're about four to five times larger as they are. So that's kind of you know, how, what our growth story is. Uh, keep an eye on the you know, version two that's coming, and uh, version two has got a lot more features and you know, way to distinguish ourselves. We were trying to get it done through before this ETH India, but it looks like it's going to be early January. So we will we kind of work it out, and obviously please be in touch, and we can talk about those details as well. Right. Again, if you want to contribute to Stack OS, reach out. We have a booth out there. We're really really good. And um, one thing to do is that you know you can join the ambassador program and also follow us, right? Again, this will be recorded and you can always stop by our booth. One thing I want to mention is for the ones who are starting up, you know, we have some really good uh, venture capital firms as well. Um, so please do go to our, our desk. Or if, I'm not sure if we have uh, forms here. Fill the details then there for that. And uh, we have some con contacts with VCs as well. So if your product is good, please reach out. We'll follow the seed, one of the biggest. Uh, you know, uh, one of the best venture capital firms is, is kind of based from Australia, is, is over here. They have, you know, Andre is here. He was very kind enough to accept our invitation here. So, you know, please reach out, and I think we can make some great connections. Yeah? Uh, before this, now let me just get to the next part of the section, which is uh, the next, next part of the presentation, which is kind of just showing you how it is and how easy or hard it can be for you to deploy, right? So this is a new account. So what I'm going to do is, uh, first of all, or if you guys, can you just try to see if you can import that wallet into your MetaMask? You've been able to do it? How many of you have been able to import the new wallet, which is there? OK. So uh, does everyone have MetaMask? Because I know the cloud is increasing. Guys, FYI, if you're not able to hear me, please feel free to come in front. There is uh, the, your headphones which you can use to, to hear me properly. Yeah. But do you guys, did you all find uh, a barcode in front of you, all of you? So raise your hands if you have found that barcode on your seat. Okay, so that's a good number of people. All right, so just again, open MetaMask, you know, on the Polygon network, scan it, and that ball will be imported. It will have some, you know, credits to for you to use. Um, you know, use them. If you don't use them, it'll probably be taken away later on. But please use them. I think it'll be of a lot of value. All right. So once you have MetaMask, what I would do is, you know, if I have my f if I'm using my phone to log in, um, I would just use Wallet Connect, and then you can just scan that with your MetaMask, it will automatically just log you in, right? Um, for this presentation, since I want to show you what has, what's happening here, I'm just going to use my laptop to really log in and stuff. So um, I also have MetaMask on my laptop. I can, I'll can i just say MetaMask, um, and it asks me to connect to a, uh, a subnet. I'll pick authority, and once I do that, I, do, I just sign a message. Once that happens, it will take me to the next section where you can uh, basically see that you know uh, you don't have any apps deployed but this is kind of the screen you'll see in front of you right and uh, now let's say i want to do a few things i'll just go f maybe i'll start with giving an overview of this of this site right, of the dashboard um, again all the deployed apps will be shown here and uh, you know over here on the on the top left you'll see different uh, kind of things so like let's say first we'll show you the cpu how much you have bought and how much is being used uh, you know your uh, bandwidth uh, your memory and your storage right so you can basically pick what you need and once you do that you, uh, you know 
you can go to the hardware place to basically show you what you can purchase, how much you can purchase. So you can actually just click here and purchase resources and then just add how much compute you need, right? And then you do next and then you are able to uh, pay, right? What I'm going to do right now is go give you a much more simpler example. Uh, but if you have to go to the App Store, you could go to App Store and once you're there, you can kind of, um, you know, you have a, you know, a set of applications already here, right? So uh, what I'm going to do is, as an example, uh, show you how to deploy an app and without actually paying for it right now, but, you know, uh, or the workflow itself, I think it'll work. So deploy, custom image, but, you know, one disclo you know, disclosure here in good faith. This is a new UI, UI which we have. So I hope you guys don't face any bugs here, but if you do, please report them. It'll help us in trying to just oh no, make it well. Um, again, the domain name, which I probably didn't mention earlier, is app-v2.stackos.io, right? And that is the new domain for, for the new version of UI. In case it's not working for you or there's some glitches here or there, go to app.stackos.io. That is the older UI. But so this is the older UI, but this is the exact same thing. It's just a better experience over here. Yeah. So uh, let's say I'm going to pick uh, this image in Docker. So <coughs> yeah. So this is an you know uh, an open source uh, Ethereum explorer. So in, in that, when you kind of go down, you know you would traditionally run. Let's, let's say for this example, you run this command to run this Docker image locally and run, get that application running, right? So on Stack, oh, just keep in mind that you see, is it clear enough? Yeah, OK. Is it, can you guys read this? OK. So um, you can basically, you know, if this is the command you run, your port 8080, your image name and whatnot. Um, so you just come here and do this exact same thing. Copy your Docker image name, give your tag name there, um, and, and your application name. So I'll just keep it Explorer. Next. Here is where I put the port IDs. So this port is what your container port and what do you want exposed. So you say 8080. And then you have your host URL. Uh, this can be any domain you want. Um, I'll just take for now, for this case, I'll just take this as domain which Stackhouse provides you by default. Um, once you're there, you can basically save a stateful set. You can basically set a replica account. So let's say I want one as a replica account. Um, and then you know, if I want a stateful set, I can fill that up. Or I could, uh, you know, if I have to pass arguments in Docker, you can pass, pass arguments as well. So you can pass arguments. If you have environment variables, you can just, you know, um, just put up here. If you have a command which has to pass at runtime, you can do that. But in this case, with this example, we don't need any, as you saw already. So I'll just do next, and I'll pick my compute. You know, keep this prices. In, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to pay 100% for everything. You don't need a four gig uh, machine to run a smaller applications. And in most cases, if you don't have traffic, you can use less, right? So that's something, just pick low. And if you need more credits, that's fine. Please reach out. I think you get $5 worth of stack tokens and like $1 worth of Matic. So if you need more for your application, please reach out to our desk and we'll give you more. For this example, I'll just pick, I'll just pick 100, 100, 1 GB bandwidth, next. Uh, it's going to tell me how much I need and stuff. It's telling I don't have any subscription yet. So, and you know, uh, what I will do is uh, I'll, I'll just try to purchase them on the fly, right? So I just do a deploy. It will um, you know, send uh, MetaMask to open. And here I can just pay for it. Now, it can take the Polygon time to finish the transaction. Um, all of us probably are aware that in some, when there's a lot of uh, load on, on the network, it tends to become slower. So I'm, I'm hoping nobody's minting NFTs, uh, nobody's having NFT sales in the bear market. Um, so the transaction should probably go very quickly. But it is kind of the, still the cheapest chain, so it kind of works out really well. There you go. All right, perfect. So you just saw this I, application got deployed. I don't know, I think maybe like in 5, 10, 15 seconds. So I'll just copy the external DNS. And the app is up. So that's how quick it is to deploy on Stack OS, right? And I can assure you, and for the ones who have used AWS, it's going to be quite a while to get anything running. Uh, so that's kind of what we really bring in to this to this space. Now, uh, let me give you another kind of example here, right? So I'll just close this. And um, let's say if you want to really see what's happening on the network, so you can basically go run a shell. Um, let me just you know, if you, in case you don't want to do this, you can actually you know, purchase your hardware directly instead of going through at that deployment time. So um, I, let's say I want to do um, 500 millicores of CPU. Memory, next. I can I get the, no. Um, I'm lucky to just have two minutes stack in my wallet. 
Um, but not everyone will, of you will have it, so please reach out if you need more. So I'm, I'm right now what I'm doing is giving a demo of how you can purchase compute uh, you know, separately from a deployment, right? So, um, okay, error, but that's fine. But, I, but I'm sure it's got already bought you. So if you see this 500, um, you know, has been bought here. Uh, all I do is now I can just basically go and deploy any apps, right, as I want. In this example, let me just see if I can launch a shell to see what's happening there. So I can, you know, create some credentials and password, username and passwords to log in. And, um, yeah. In fact, uh, the shell is, is a, just as, as an equivalent of um, what you would, as is another application on the net web. Yep, so it's going to take some few minutes to, to start up, but let me see if it's already up here. Perfect, it looks like it's there. So I, I can just pass the credential which I chose to, to create that uh, service. And then you can basically say things, right? So how many of you guys know Kubernetes and um, the commands for that? OK, decent. You can easily just do the same thing. So all your Kubernetes commands will kind of work here. Get pods, right? So this is basically how you see um, the services which are running right now on, on, on my network. Right? So my wallet is my network here. That's what controls everything. So uh, you'd see Explorer, WebUDY, and stuff. So the other two applications which are running. So you can again troubleshoot if you want to see logs. You could do cube ctl logs. This one, right? Um, and, and you can basically see like you know what logs were there. And if you refresh the page more times, you can see that. If you couldn't tail it again, the commands are just as um, it is the same general commands which you use for Kubernetes. So it, it supports that um, logs. I think it is dash f if I'm not wrong to do a follow, right? So when people uh, as and when people are serving this website, so you just see I just press some enters here. I'll refresh this page, and um, and you should see that uh, that coming right. So that's kind of you can actually see the logs as well as they're generated, right? So yeah, I mean otherwise you can go to your app store and you can pick an app from this place uh, pretty easily. So for the ones um, I'll just show a game like how fast it can deploy. If you, if the app is on the app store, you can just click and run it. So for this one, I'll do hexgl deploy. I'll just use the same uh, name, or I can change the name if I want to, but I'll just keep it this way. Next, everything is pre-configured. It's saying I don't have enough compute here, but you know I will it'll automatically buy uh, as I'm running the transaction. Insufficient resources. Okay, looks like I don't have enough. But if you did, you'd be able to see an app here, right? Let me see if I can just delete something and create um, the ping. So I'll just go here. Um, I'll just delete the shell because it, I, I think it takes pretty good amount of resources. I'm not sure if I have enough again still. Um, maybe I do. All right, so I'll just come here and I'll uh, just want to deploy this HexGL game. And um, everything, as you see, I've got enough capacity available now. Deploy. All right. So that game now is, is deployed on Stack OS. So you can just copy that domain, enter, and the app will be up in a second. So. This is the internet speed, not my fault. <laughs> um, in a second, it'll, it'll probably just load up completely, and then it should be pretty easy to run. So the entire game right now is, you know, 
I don't want to show off my skills of not being able to play properly. But, you know, that's kind of uh, what it is, right? So this is a real game which is working on the decentralized cloud. And you saw how quick, quick it was to really running and, you know. Uh, I hope you kind of enjoyed what I just showed you. Uh, if there are any open questions, you know, please ask those questions. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Anyone have any questions here, guys? There's a microphone which is going around. Do you have, yeah, okay, there's a question there. Uh, so who's uh, running the servers? Uh, is, is it a group of operators or where is it all hosted? Yeah, it's a great question. So what happens is that there are people around the world uh, who can run these networks. So they can, they basically, uh, we have an orchestration layer, orchestration layer on top of Kubernetes, right? So people or operators around the world who can run Kubernetes servers, they can basically launch it, install our services there, and then connect it you know, uh, with overall the blockchain network which we have. It's a layer one for infrastructure, so that's how that communication and everything gets handled. Um, we are, as I said, with the V2 version is much more uh, complex and it's much more powerful as well. But that's kind of how it works. Anyone in the world can basically create an account uh, and uh, you know, with your obviously MetaMask, not taking your grandfather's details, but um, you'll be able to just you know add your clusters to the network, and when people are deploying, they just deploy in those servers, and they get paid for uh, the cluster operators get paid for uh, hosting the applications there. Uh, how are you ensuring that the cluster operators serve the right content and they're not acting maliciously? Yeah, so that's the question of verification, right? And uh, there, there are a few things. So um, what 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 is done is that um, when people are running uh, services, there is another service which sits on the cluster, and uh, that's its job is to basically verify what's running there. And then what happens is that since the network, are con all the clusters are connected with each, each other, they can keep pinging to ensure that the version which is, is there is, is true version. And the moment they detect that uh, there is a malicious cluster doing Ill illegal things, they will lose their you know, stack tokens and they have some more you know, things in place as a collat collateral which the guarantee is there for and they just get slashed. So that's kind of how it works. It's much like the new V2 of uh, Ethereum. Um, and um, you know, same thing goes with Polygon as well, right? Because if, you, if, if there's a malicious actor or a malicious node, it just completely removes them from the from network and they lose their share of things. So that's how we do it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great question, actually. Thank you. Yeah. One last question? Yeah. They never give me time to host this. Yeah, thing. I don't uh, know why. So I wanted to know, hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. OK, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I wanted to understand if, uh, if let's say, I have a microservices architecture, and you said like we have pods. Yeah. So if I wanted all of the pods to be in a yes. one particular cluster yes. in a specific region, because I know my uh -huh. users are coming from US, so why right. would I want to have it in India? Can yeah. we do that? Yes. Uh, the concept of V2, which is coming, actually, V2 makes it more easier. Right, right. now, it's kind of distributed. Um, but with the V2, what happens is that um, you can create a subnet. So people don't create clusters, really. They create right. a subnet. Yeah. And that could be, that could be for, uh, you know, for purposes more than this, for example, for GDPR compliance, right. for the ones you know, who want only European regions to be deployed onto. So you can have a custom subnet serving a specific problem. Let's say, for example, gaming, right? And you want high GPU kind of servers and clusters. Right. You can add a subnet for that specifically, right? So that's kind of the feature which comes with V2. Right now, uh, you know, you basically are kind of distributed. So it's random right now. It, it is, yeah, no, it, is, it is right now. But you know, it, 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 I think in January, it should be uh, like more proficient that way. Mm -hmm. But um, talking of it from just this point of view, I think that's how we kind of work. work. Right. And once that subnet is basically deployed, is it like only my applications are going to be in the subnet? Or is it going to be everybody else? Like it will yeah. be shared across other uh, not mine services as well? Or is it like private yeah. to me? So your application is always private to you. Okay. So the way it works is that um, any application with, when you are signing with your wallet, it ensures that there is a separate isolation of your network just for you. Okay. So even though right now it's you know, uh, it's kind of protected that way, but it kind of extends it even more further, right? Because um, if you want to deploy, actually, that's a good follow-up, you know, an answer to this as well. Is that let's say you have um, an application which requires backend, uh, two different backends, right? And let's say um, AI thing as well, a database as well. So what you can do is that you can give environment variables for the endpoint within the pod. Uh, so within the you know, as a pod. So 
the front end can or the back end can talk to your let's say database all internal to your network so your wallet is your kind of uh, a special network just for you which only allows internal communication right so that's how it works as well if you want to you know build uh, like a two application layout or three three layer architecture yeah cool good yeah hi. thank you very much guys you know you're asking me to step down but uh please uh sorry yeah. um so please you know uh, you know come to our desk and uh, you know just ask if you have any questions we'd be happy to answer them we also have discord community you can join and ask your questions there so uh thank you very much for you know hearing me out and i hope you enjoyed this sorry